I've, I've managed to confuse Wes by um, messing up his very organized system in terms of how I actually send updates to my presentation. You didn't, you didn't follow the rules. I didn't follow the rules. And I, I, so I'd like to hereby publicly apologize to Wes for, um, for, for messing him about and not following the rules. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of um, background before we get going with the actual formal presentation just to talk about what, what I'm going to talk to you about. So um, we've, we've been excitedly watching the potential of JPEG excess in, in the promises that that compression gives us for, I guess, probably the last two years as, as that, standardized and that standardization process has been working and going through. Um, where we come from, I work for Nevia, I'm their chief technologist, and we do a lot of contribution, and increasingly over the last couple of years, a lot of what I would call distributed production um, connectivity, so people wanting to do stuff together from different locations. And as you're well aware, if you're involved in any of that, latency is, is a real killer. So, and it's the latency that's really important. Now, traditionally, um, with wide area networking, bandwidth has been a challenge. And, and bandwidth is a challenge because obviously it costs. Now, within countries now, we're actually seeing an environment where you know, relatively high bandwidth is relatively low cost, but still internationally, there's a fair cost associated with that. So the solution that I'm gonna talk to you about, which has just been deployed um, in the last few months um, and is, is imminently going live any day now, um, is, is actually an, an international, it's a pan-European international distributed network and the, um, the customer wanted basically to do uh, distributed production between various locations in the central Western European area, if you like. And what, we, what they wanted to do was to absolutely minimize the latency. So typically, if we're looking at doing um, low latency, obviously, we, we look for intra-frame intra compression if we can't afford to go uncompressed in terms of the bandwidth cost. And, and until now, you know, the, the, our go-to would have been JPEG 2000. That's been the stalwart of what we've been doing uh, as a company and most of the solutions that we've delivered in the last 10 years um, for, for international connectivity where they've had reasonably high bandwidth available have been, have been um, JPEG 2000. Now, for those of you that have been following the standards of JPEG 2000, as that's evolved, um, it, there was a there was a various incarnations of it, but in 2013 there was the the first incarnation of TRO1, which is a standardised way, an interoperable way of handing off JPEG 2000, which was a real uplift for the industry, and everyone involved in that collectively got an Emmy. So it has to be a technical Emmy. So it was definitely worth doing. Um, the challenge with that was, and it wasn't a challenge; it was just a statement of capability. Was that was typically a, um, effectively roughly going to be the cost of it is f three frames or three fields, depending on whether you're progressive or interlaced, in terms of the end-to-end -end delay you incur. Because if you're doing a full field compression, you need to read in that, that whole field or frame first, then do the compression, which takes some finite time. Far end, you do the same, then you play it out again. So roughly speaking, um, I think we got it down to excluding any additional buffering, the order of in a, in a P50 environment or, or an I50 environment, the order of about 60 milliseconds plus buffering along the, along the way. So typically you're then looking about 80 milliseconds by the time you've actually got a whole ecosystem together, plus the transit latency that you're going to incur on your connectivity. And that transit latency, you know, within a country and within, within a small Western European thing could be the order of maybe 10 milliseconds or something like that. That, that order of time for the speed of light in fiber. So that's where we had, had got to. Um, where we were, um, what happened then um, in 2018, so only last year, there was the standardization um, of a, a new variant of TRO1, and what that gave is the ability to actually do much lower latency, and basically the innovation involved in there was rather than compressing the whole, the whole video frame in one, in, as one image, you actually compress stripes. So if you think about, you know, in our traditional legacy raster scan way, we've actually got, you know, the first part of the picture appears first. So if we actually take N lines and, and do a compression on them, um, we can then send that data and that can be propagating and decoding and reassembled whilst we send the next bit. So 
if you think about it, the, the number of stripes that you split it into roughly dictates the kind of order of magnitude of benefit that you can get from doing, from doing that striping. And that allows you to reduce the latency significantly from the, you know, the typically the 60 milliseconds, which we're talking about in a 50 hertz world, to certainly sub-20 milliseconds in an end-to-end -end environment. So a significant benefit. Thank you so much, Wes. And my final public apology is given now. <coughs> so we'll, we'll jump back on, onto the thread up the way I was intending to present it. Now I have the slides. So this is, this is an overview of the, of the customer requirements, what we were looking to do. So a, a large broadcaster, pan-European connectivity, as I already said, and they had specific requirements to, to, to route and control connectivity both within campuses, within facilities, and between many facilities um, within that geographic territory. And they needed the lowest latency as possible because if you're, wanting, if you're going to do distributed production, then you actually want that as quick as you possibly can. And again, as I've alluded to already, the optimized use of finite WAN resources. So in, in this situation, you know, there is a cost associated with wide area ne ne network connectivity. And even if you have 100 gigabits per second, if you're trying to do many, 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 many tens of video channels, et cetera, then you do need to consider um, doing some level of compression. They also wanted it to be 2110 based and incorporate um, what we colloquial in, in Nivion call SIPs, but 2022-7, a dual diverse RTP packet protection and merge technology. And I guess the final key customer requirement that we're faced with on this was, was it was short time scales. So uh, some of you will say that's very familiar and most, most, most projects have some short time scales. So I've, I think I've pretty well talked you through this slide here, which is like some of the mezzanine compression options available. So I'm, I'm really focusing on the wavelet options. There are obviously a couple of DCT options, intra options that we could have considered here. But these were the, obviously, if, as you can see from those numbers, all things being equal, why would we not go with excess? Um, because it gives us so much of a lower latency than everything else. Um, and if we look at the kind of that typical transit delay we're incurring as well, then actually the, the compression would have been a significant influencer. So. That's the, that was the, the, the options, if you like, of where we could go. So one, one, uh, one slide on, on excess stuff, just to give you some background, and I'm going to give a plug for another presentation in a couple of minutes where you'll hear even more about this. So a few things you may or may not, not know about it. So it's a wavelet-based compression. So it's from the same family as JPEG 2000 that so many of us have known and loved for so long. Um, and it's, it's basically just doing stripes or very tiny stripes down to kind of the line level um, or a few lines level. So it's obviously intra-frame. There is no, there's no prediction. There's no, no, other, uh, no other work involved there. And it gives you a very fixed latency because you're compressing. You're actually using a fixed number of lines. You're applying, the, you're applying the compression and you're doing the same at the other end. Um, a, an adjustable compression ratio like we've enjoyed with JPEG 2000. Now, the exactly what compression ratio you judge to be um, acceptable for your application is going to be different. It's, I think it's different from the computer graphics industry to the broadcast television industry. And, um, but we, we reckon typically probably 8 to 1 to 10 to 1 visually lossless is, is, is where, where it's going to end up in terms of the, the, the decisions people are making. But it could be anywhere from 6 to 1 to 10 to 1 probably is, is that judgment place. Obviously, it's constant bit rate because of the way, the way it works, and, and, and it's, it's, it's deterministic constant bit rate as well. There's no kind of buffer management stuff happening within it that, that would cause um, problems. Obviously, it supports the various color spaces. It supports different color resolutions, different bit, bit depths, and you can apply it to both interlaced and progressive frames. Many spatial resolutions and all the typical frame rates. So a highly flexible toolkit of stuff that we've got within the JPEG XS standard to actually to make use of. Um, so just a big plug. Tomorrow morning, um, a friend of mine from um, Interpix who's, uh, who have been innovating in this technology and helping to drive this, um, he's going to be presenting just about XS for a whole session tomorrow morning. So get out of bed early and come on, uh, on Saturday morning if you want to actually learn even more details about the specifics of JPEG XS itself. Uh, he's, he's the real guru on that. 
So moving back to the, the, that customer requirement of 2110, um, many of you will have been following this, and if any of you have seen my, my presentations over the last three years as we've been evolving 2110, you'll see the number of blobs here has been gradually growing. Um, this is, I think, the latest number of blobs of things that are either already existing or things that are actually being worked on within the, within the standards group. The specific one, which is actually is almost coming of age around this moment, I'm not sure, we're within, within weeks, certainly, of it finally being published, is, is the compressed video Dash 22. Um, and uh, one of the reasons, one of the benefits that we've actually seen of that specifically for this project is it's, al it's allowed us to take JPEG XS and actually create compressed video essences and have them still existing as part of a 2110 ecosystem. So that's incredibly important. So, so that means we can actually do, continue the whole, if you like, continuous JPEG um, 2110 ecosystem between locations. Um, and obviously the audio we're not compressing, so the audio can go through as is. The video we can apply this mezzanine ultra low latency compression to, and uh, that actually ties in really well with everything we've been doing. We have a platform um, that we've been um, developing lots of different solutions on, and that's, this is the platform specifically that we've chosen to implement and deploy JPEG XS on. Just a little bit more about the specific um, implementation itself. So um, this just shows you kind of the nuts and bolts of the engines and how we've actually put it together. Fundamentally, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this in just a minute, one of, one of the key things here is that we're actually now in the world of taking existing IP video and putting out IP videos. So the fundamental job of this compression engine now is actually IP in, IP out. So we can come in as 2110-20 and go out as 2110-22, um, and vice versa when we need to the other end. So, so very, much, um, very much an IP to IP processing capability. As, as you're aware, the, um, the, the way that um, 2022, sorry, yeah, 2022-7 has been defined um, or redefined last year allows it to apply to all of the 2110 flows so we can actually use the existing RTP merge technology to give that dual path protection um, on JPEG XS just as we can on the uncompressed video flows as well. So just a few, um, a few quick slides um, just to sort of show you the generics of, of what's um, what's been deployed, how we've done. So we, we've um, recently completed doing the initial deployment. It's probably a little bit difficult to, for you to see that back here, but what you can see here is we've got the 2110-30 audio and the dash 20 video that's going in on this side and is going over the network. So we had an initial phase and then um, the high level architecture of the concept of the solution overall is to have a couple of different hubs, um, diverse hubs in different countries which are interconnected. Um, and nominally, each of the um, production areas within the, uh, the different countries involved will actually be honed on one or other of those hubs. But the architecture has the flexibility to actually assign between hubs. So there's a great deal of flexibility in terms of um, re dynamically rerouting the, the resources available in the hubs to the different users. So just a little bit about the, um, uh, the video and audio signal flows. So you can see here now we're talking about having this gateway function here. So this is kind of the gateway function at the edge of this, of this campus world. And that's um, allowing us to actually take the excess feeds, the far end. And what you'll notice is we can actually do that in that dual redundant way. And then in a very similar manner, we have the audio flow. So you'll see it's similarly dual path. So we're running 2022-7 on, on the audio flows as well. What you'll also note that's very different to most WAN deployments that have been done to date is those are now traversing a separate thing. So a lot of solutions that have actually um, used 2110 within the production systems have typically gone to 2022-6, co the composite video, if you like, um, in between to actually carry everything synchronized together. But because of this world we're now in, where both all of our endpoints are actually running to, to, a, 
to a, um, you know, a satellite GPS synchronized PTP world, then we've actually got the, th the same time. So we can actually do realignment automatically of the different audio and video flows as they come through. Now, I always have to have a don't forget the audio slide because um, I, I think if you see almost any presentation about um, the, the complexity of deployment, um, the video actually usually turns out to be the easy bit and the audio um, is, has more challenges simply because of the number of audio channels that are needed, this, the sheer volume, also the fact that you've got to do lots of compensatory delay to cope with other things that are happening in the chain. So, so uh, th being able to matrix the audio and to reassign things has been incredibly important and manipulate the audio at a sort of mono-channel level. If you like a glorified IP audio AES67 slash 2110-30 shuffling capability with all of the other features that you would need there. I mentioned this IP to IP processing world. I think that's very important because this is kind of a milestone we've got to with, um, with, with this deployment um, because this is like true IP production infrastructure at each end and then IP connectivity between. And what we're looking to do is actually do just processing functions of compression that are just IP to IP. So these devices don't actually have a video interface in sight. They're just taking IP in and IP out. And this is one of the first points that I think we've genuinely seen this as a true, uh, as a, as a true requirement where we're actually, you know, we, we don't even have to supply um, um, SDI interfaces at all. Just moving on to time, I always want to talk about time. I usually try and get something about time into every presentation I give. Um, and this is, Im this is important because one of the things that kind of got a little bit left behind um, in the original implementations and work on 2110 was how time was handled through a production process. By that I mean we very, very carefully defined in the standards the, the use of taking absolute real time and time stamping the camera images and the, audio Im and the audio samples as they're made and the microphones at the front end. So the, the actual acquisition time was very carefully be de defined to be locked to or to be time stamped with, with absolute time by the very definition of 2110. What has happened in a lot of, in what I would say is a woolly implementation, a woolly definition in the first release of 2110-10 um, is that some of, the, um, some of the way that that's been implemented by a lot of manufacturers means that that timing information gets destroyed at the, the time it goes through the first processing element because the, pr the, the processing elements don't actually maintain the timing relationship of the, of you, if you like, video frame N with its original acquisi acquisition time. And for us to run these ecosystems properly, that's what we need to have. We need to actually be able to track origination time through a system. Um, one, of the th one of the things that's actually happened in the one-year review on 2110-10 is we've actually added in two definitions of different ways of helping us to track and time through a production environment. So time, very important. But one of the things that we're very pleased about, um, sorry, I've, uh, yes, this is the origination time I was going to show you there, is the, um, the way we've implemented it within this solution is the, there is effectively the input timing is transferred to the output timing frame for frame. So we actually honor the origination timestamp of the, of, the, of the video as it passes through this system. So there is no ambiguity of the time. And that's incredibly important because, uh, like John was saying in the last presentation, you don't want to have to have loads of people manually realigning audio and video synchronization. In this world where everything's timestamped, that ought to be a given. We ought to be able to get things in synchronization um, automatically. So this is a key enabler, and, and it, it was a good point to have got to. This is a milestone um, to have done this. So it's worth making sure that the architecture of solutions you guys deploy actually does this, do this. A quick plug as we're drawing to the end here. Um, this <coughs> I'm going to be talking more about how we transport 2110 over WAN. Um, on a t um, at noon here on Monday, um, there's been a, a working group of some very learned bra brains from the industry that have come together roughly every couple of weeks um, since, the since the beginning of the year to look at how we actually want to do best practice for interoperable handoff 
of both the media essences and of all the associated control plane information that we need to actually have properly federated and interoperating facilities. And these may be full campuses, they may be trucks, whatever. Um, so that plays into the, the, the presentation I've just been giving you because that is actually looking at, um, if you like, connectivity between, between um, facilities. Also, if you'd like to see the JPEG XS in action here now, we've actually got a live demonstration of it actually running um, here at IBC. I believe it's the very first one here, as I believe the, the main deployment that we've done is the first one globally. So we actually have a, a three-way connectivity. We have connectivity um, from a site in Hilversum, which is about 30 kilometers away or so, into Sony's stand. And then we have connectivity between Sony and us. So we've got a three location distributed 4K production environment we've set up, um, which is using very low latency JPEG XS um, to actually connect between them. So that's an exciting place to have got to. So quick summary, because I see the clock is, is, is moving forward. So the key, the key exciting news is JPEG XS is working. Now I, I would caveat to say there are a few standards ratifications that I think are still outstanding. So it's kind of still, not quite rubber stamped through all the processes, and neither is 2110-22. That hasn't come out the, the sausage machine yet fully ratified at the end. So there's some sausage machine production, but you know, this is, it's a 99% there, and uh, as always, these solutions are software, software created now so we can tweak if needed, but it's very excited to have got this first one off the ground. It means that low latency federated production is a real possibility. And basically what it's now done is it's reduced the compression element to being negligible, which is the key thing. So, so really the transit time is the actual dominant thing now. And I've, I mentioned this, I think, in a previous presentation, but with the, the speed of light in fiber, they're talking about using hollow fiber now, which takes you from two times 10 to eight to three times 10 to eight meters a second. So we can do that even quicker. So that combined with this ultra low latency stuff means that we can do even faster, um, even lower latency distributed production. The 2110-22 has been a great addition to the suite. Um, it was, you know, I have to admit I had some skepticism when it was first mooted, but actually seeing this kind of application, it's an, it is such a good fit to have it as part of that ecosystem. And the ongoing work that we're looking at in the VSF activity group on the, on the WAN transport to try and bring a unified approach to how we handle WAN interconnect in general, I think, is very important. And obviously, being able to deliver in short customer timelines is in, an important thing as well. And finally, as it's always customary for me to say, if you want to come for the best cup of tea at IBC, then do come and see us in Hall 1, B79, right near the front of the hall. And I would love to put the kettle on and make you a cup of tea. So thank you very much. Uh, we want coffee, Andy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. So um, we have time for um, some questions here. And um, you know, the, the, the beauty of this presentation that Andy's uh, been just given is that these are real applications. These are not fantasies. These are not things that are imagined or proposed or you know, we believe we can do them. These are actually being done. And I think that's really uh, critical. So um, anybody have any questions? Yes. Uh, can you say a little bit more about 2110 end-to-end -end timing. I think if my understanding was originally it was only link timing that was defined. Okay, thank you. Yes. So I, I could actually talk for a very long time about this, but I'll give you a very, a very. You a got very five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll give you the two-minute view, and then I'm more than happy to expand one-to-one -one later if you like. But um, yeah. So so what 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 basically um, 2110 defined was very carefully that how we origination time and timestamp the essences as they are created. Now there's some debate on synthetic essences, et cetera, as to quite what we, how we handle that. But basically, as we acquire a video image or an audio sample, we timestamp that. So we actually know the absolute time. Now, I think one thing that was overlooked was that um, that time, if you actually have a piece of equipment downstream that just takes that time in and maybe uses it for its own purposes, but doesn't link that to the way it then onward forwards the data in the production chain as, as there. So then, then you actually lose, you potentially lose the, any information about origination time. Now there's been various thinking about this. The BBC had some ideas early on and other people have had various proposals. But what we've now 
managed to put into the revision of 21.10-10 as a clarification point, because it was, to be honest, ambiguous, is that what we're saying is that you can declare in, in your SDP, in the information you publish as your source, that this time is actually the same as this time with relation to the origination time of video sample n. So if video sample n occurred at time x, then, then video sample n here is still, time, is still stamped as arriving as being at time x. Now those purists um, for the, the, um, look, look at the original RFC, if you like, for um, RTP, may say actually the RTP timestamp should be a transport timestamp, not a not a um, not a, a timestamp of of the actual essence, but effectively, but in the work we originally did with um, RTP, we effectively have already overtaken that as effectively an origination time information, and we've also screwed up um, the original RFC for um, RTP timestamping in other ways because we've done things like say um, we're going to freeze the timestamp throughout the video frame, so every all of the video frame has the same RTP timestamp. That's actually not legit from a from an RFC point of view from the original intention of RTP. So we've done a few other things. So what we're saying here is here is that we, we, there's now an option for this device to say the time you're seeing on the timestamps coming out of me is actually actually as on as the origination time. So obviously, if every point, if every time, <coughs> if every piece of equipment in the chain does that then when you get to this use time that I've got here at the end, where we've actually got different flows, different time flows for the different audio and video and other metadata streams that may be happening, at this use time, if we've actually been honoring that origination time um, in the processing, then this can be fully automatic. The, the realignment here can be fully automatic. And that's, that's to me, an obvious, an obvious way that we should be behaving within this ecosystem, so we actually don't have to even ever consider manual compensation for system delay anymore. Does that help? So, so when you talk about this storage device, so we the, rollover period, sorry, the rollover period is around 13 hours. The yes. So, so when you talk about disk storage, there is when we talk about synthetic sources, there's a whole there's a whole other gamut of questions as to what we define as time, because maybe you actually want to define a, a storage system, a server replay. Um, you actually maybe want to regenerate time as t equals zero, if you like, as you emit that. So, so although it's a synthetic source, that's something that's been pre-acquired, you're actually bringing it into your live production system. At, at, a, at a defined time. There's a whole load of debate going on and, and other conversations on sy synthetic sources. But yeah, the, the rollover time's key. So this is all about managing that small amount of time, you know, milliseconds or maybe seconds in, in the production system. Right, and, and we're not really going to use RTP timestamps for disk storage. No, no, we're absolutely not. We're going to convert it over to some sort of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, once you go into that domain, you'd be transferring that information. But the, the whole key thing here was about the ability to track time. Right. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Thank you very much.